we're going to go over a little bit um, about how to get the yolk started and then the details of how to shape it, how to um, make some adjustments to the length and um, how to decide what colors to use and what charts. So without further ado, I'm gonna start my slideshow and then we can um, go through that and answer any questions as we go or at the end. So feel free to interrupt if you have a question that's related to what I'm talking about and you think you'll forget it or it's a good time to ask it right at that time. And um, yeah, and then um, at the end, I'm gonna show you my favorite um, short road technique as a little demo, because I found it way easier than the whole wrap and turn thing, which is what's in my book. I learned it later. So let's see, let's find the slideshow. Can you know, can you all see that now? Okay, and you can pin it if to make it bigger. Got it? Okay. So this is the same image we've been looking at and we finished one and two, or at least we finished talking about one and two. If we didn't finish knitting it, that's okay. We, we, we talked about the body, we talked about the sleeves. Now the yoke is the um, most complicated part and the most knitting in one section because we're combining the stitches from the sleeves and the body all together. So we're gonna have a lot of stitches for a while. So what we're gonna do talk about in this slideshow is joining the pieces together. And we'll talk about the basic shaping of the yoke. We'll talk about how long the yoke should be. And if you need to adjust that, especially for the back. And then I'll show you the uh, German short rows and we'll talk about, um, like I said, how to do the color patterns and different ways you can combine the colors uh, besides how it's shown in the, the drawings that I included with the pattern. So joining the body, this is the same image we looked at before. And we have um, three pieces now, it's on the bottom. We have three pieces, two sleeves in the body, and we're gonna set aside a small number of stitches for the underarm on each sleeve and on each side of the body. And then we're gonna put them all together kind of like it's shown there. And then we'll be knitting that top part all as one kind of cone. So this is, this is how we do it. And this is from my ethnic knitting book that you have. So you can look through this if you want, but there's also instructions in the, in the separate pattern I sent you. Basically, we're gonna start where the yellow begins on the uh, lower right of this drawing. And we're going to be uh, putting those stitches on. So body stitches, and we'll say those are the back for now. We're going to put those back stitches onto a needle and then the sleeve stitches onto that needle. You can use one really long circular. You'll, you'll probably have about 60 inches or more of knitting around your upper body where the sleeves are. You don't need a 60 inch needle, a 48 inch you know, we'll hold it. Um, if you're making a larger size, a 60 inch will be better. I like the needle to be a little shorter than the total number, you know, the total size I have so that it's not stretched around the needle. But of course you can use two circulars too. And so what I've drawn here is one way you could set up two circulars, which is, and this is for a pullover. We'll look at a cardigan next. You can put the back and one sleeve on the first circular and the front and the second sleeve on the second circular. That's, that's one way to do it. And that way your um, back and you know each piece is all together on a needle. You're not switching needles like in the middle of a sleeve or whatever. Now going backwards, you could put your needles like this if you wanted to do it on two circulars. You could put the front of each sleeve and the front of the body on one circular so that your needle switches right at your, you know, middle of your arm. You could do it that way. I like this sec uh, second way better because then you, if you do get a, a ladder or a pinch in the color work or something, it's gonna be between the sleeve and the body, not on the outside edge. 
So that's why that's why it's uh, usually written this way. Of course, if it's on one big circular, it doesn't matter at all because you'll just have markers between the sections. And that's not even that important. You, you don't even have to put markers between the sections on the yoke sweater because the patterning runs continuously all around the yoke and the decreases run continuously all around the yoke. So there's really no specific line between the sleeve and the body. It's just how you had the stitches from the before. The lower part of the sweater has separation for sleeve and the body. So we put them together that way, but it just becomes one big circle. So that's what it looks like on the pullover. On the cardigan, of course, you are end of the round is in the center front. So separating the yellow and the purple here into two needles, that's probably how I would do it on here. Um, you could still do it the other way. And then your steak, center front opening steak would be you know, in the middle of a needle, not at the end of a needle. And that's fine too. Either way is uh, you know, fine. Um, like I said, because it becomes just a circle. The only difference on the cardigan is that you've got these extra stitches in the circle that you're going to cut open at some point. But it doesn't really matter where they are on the needles as far as that goes. What it's just showing is, you know, where your end around marker is going to go if you don't start your needle at the center front. You're going to have an end of brown marker there. Um, and if you're working on one big circular needle, your end of round marker will be at the center front on a cardigan, whereas going back here on the pullover, your center front, your uh, end of round marker will be between uh, the yellow and purple. One of those sections of the yellow and purple will be your end of round. So that's the only difference there. But basically you end up with this one big circle. Okay, so that was just setting it up. So we're gonna put body sleeve, body sleeve, all into one big circle. And then we're gonna knit in the round as one, and it's sort of shaped like a cone. Uh, it's got some curves in it, cause we have shoulders. We don't just go cone from our, you know, underarm to our neck, we have the shoulders, um, but that's it. So this uh, bottom part here, shows all the stitches put together. And in, the, in between those, you can see the little zigzag line is where the underarm stitches are set aside. This picture is from Knitting in the Old Way by Priscilla Gibson Roberts, in case you're interested. Um, it's, a, it's got all different kinds of sweaters from around the world and basic construction, things like this. It's got much less detail than my book though. So we're in my book um, where I only have a few kinds of sweaters in, in the book. And I go through and write out step-by-step -step instructions for how to make it. In Knitting in the Old Way, you don't have that. You just have the drawing and a couple paragraphs that explains in, in general terms how you make that sweater. So it's a lot more um, of figuring it out in your head and drawing your own little diagrams and maybe making notes on the instructions. Um, that said, if you, you know, do what we're doing and you are, I know some of you are working from the percentage system and using the book rather than the exact pattern. If you could do that, you can do what Priscilla Gibson Roberts has in knitting in the old way, but it does take more brain time. And so that's, you know, up to you. Some of, sometimes I don't mind it and sometimes I just want to make something that I can just follow the instructions and, and relax and do it. So anyway, so you can see we're, we're knitting that. Now I didn't talk color in the neckline because we're going to talk about the, the neck shaping options in our next class. We're going to do to talk today from where you join the body and sleeves until the shaping of the yoke is done and then there's different options for the neck. That will be later. Okay. So this is basically how the decreases are placed on the yoke. And the instructions are written from top to bottom, but we're knitting from the bottom up. So like the, the, uh, the top instruction says at one half of the length of the yoke. So say our yoke's gonna be 12 inches deep, um, just cause it's a round number. 
When it's six inches deep, we're gonna do that first increase round. And so that arrow is pointing to where that is. So we're gonna do, we're gonna be knitting along for our first six inches. We can put a color work pattern in there. When we get the six inches done, we're gonna go knit two, knit two together around. And then we're in the next section. So the first section's a half of the depth and the next two sections are each a quarter. So if it's 12 inches, it will be six, three and three, or it could be 10, two and a half, two and a half get the point. So um, the first the first one is knit two, knit two together around. The second in decrease round is knit one, knit two together around. And the third decrease round is knit one, knit two together, knit two together around. And um, so this is kind of in a way sort of like the reverse shaping of what you would do on a pie shawl. You knit a section and then you do a bunch of decreases. You knit a section, you do a bunch of decreases. There's only three of them on, on this yoke. Um, pie shawl has four or five or eight, I don't remember, but um, and also because we're not going all the way to the center and our yoke, that's a reverse pie shawl because we need a hole for our head to go through. So we stop before we go all the way down to, you know, just eight stitches, which is what you start a pie shawl with. But so that's, so that's how the pattern's written out. And that's just an overview of how it works. So, what I wanted to talk about though, and this is not in the pattern, it, you have instructions in the book. And of course I will send you this uh, PDF of this slideshow. So you'll have everything extracted here that I've got. Um, we want to lengthen the back of the sweater and I'm going to switch to my video for a second because I want to show you why we lengthen the back of the sweater. Okay. so. Look at me, pin me to big video if you want. So this is a t-shirt, right? Um, not a yoke sweater, but you can see as I turn and for many sweaters you've made, the front of my neck is lower than the back of my neck, right? About two or three inches. A lot of times I'll do it. I really like the neck to be a little bit lower than that even, so maybe four inches. But if you just make that yoke as a tube and you don't do any special, shaping or anything, then the back of the neck is going to be and the front of the neck are going to be the same height, which is, you know, not how we want it to be because it'll be like that. So to lower what will happen is to for the, the front of the neck will naturally go down lower and the shoulders will pull forward and the back of your sweater will be an inch or two inches shorter than the front of your sweater. So that's why we talk about adding some length to the back. And we're gonna do that, we're gonna talk about that in two places. Right now, we're gonna talk about it on the bottom of the yoke. And I always do that, cause I don't know if you've noticed, but this runs in my family. I have the, I have really, it's not just bad posture, it's a curvature in my shoulders. My dad and my grandmother have the same thing. I've always been this way. So, Oh, wait a minute. We have to, we have a visitor. Hi. We have a visitor, look. She's, she's little, she's, she's not sure. She's I never come in the house before, so. Oh. Aren't they so cute? They're about three months old. They're growing so fast. This one's Pepper. We have Pepper, Pearl, Pumpkin, <laughs> and Peaches. <laughs> they've gotten really big yeah, I haven't they and their fur is like three inches long I, they're starting uh -huh. to shed a little I think in the next week or two they're gonna start to shed a lot oh yes, yes. I've, it's only three months old how big yeah. will they get maybe four maybe almost four <laughs> they grow up to uh seven and a half seven. to ten pounds these they love to eat they eat non-stop <laughs> lettuce is delicious. Yeah, they love lettuce. They eat so much hay. Um, she's so precious, Donna. Thanks for sharing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He's going to go back outside now. I saw this awesome video of a woman spinning the the Angora off of the rabbit in her lap. The rabbit was like kind of sleeping in her lap and she People was literally spinning from the rabbit. 
kids will do that. They love to just sit in your lap and be petted mm -hmm. and brushed. They'll just, so I would be able to do that. Um, they don't know a lot Anything of, coming out? they don't know a lot of people yet. So mm -hmm. I don't know about bringing them into a crowd. Yeah. And they love to cuddle by your neck. So, <laughs> oh, I hear her going chum, 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 chum. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they're so cute. Very sweet. I was sweet. appalled the first time yeah. I saw someone spinning off a rabbit. She yeah, was right? pulling its fiber right out. I, I'd never seen it before. So it really, I, I, I don't know how I, 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 I don't know what I, how I thought the fiber came off the animal, but. What happens is they're all, it's when that happens, they've already shedded, but they have another coat underneath mm -hmm. and the, the outer coat is just stuck into the lower coat, but it's already disconnected from their skin. Oh, yeah, oh my gosh, I can't stand it. <laughs> okay, go back. Diva, we need one of these, puppy goose. <laughs> we need one of these. They, they take some time because you have to brush them out once or twice a week to make sure that they don't get felted and, and hay and stuff stuck in their fur. And um, they're not supposed to lick themselves too much because they can't throw up hairballs like the cat can mm -hmm. so okay. they mostly eat hay because that just pushes everything through their digestive system <laughs> because it's all roughage okay anyway <laughs> back to what we were doing which is we were talking about the neck shaping and the short row shaping right and why you want to uh, lift the back and my bad uh shaping here is so i add some uh short row shaping and this is in a lot of patterns, but not all. I add some short row shaping right at the beginning of the yoke before I start the color work. And then I add some more right before the neck neckline. So I'm adding it in two places. I would recommend everybody add short row shaping at the top, at the neckline. And the bottom part is, I recommend it, but it's optional. It's not always included in sweaters. Um, if you have any kind of curvature or bad posture like me, then you mm -hmm. want to do it in both places because that just helps because um, your sweater is going to go forward with your shoulders and adding that in the back makes it fit better. Okay, so back to our slideshow. Back to our regularly programmed whatever. <laughs> All right. So this is, this is showing how the short rows work. And actually this, they go all the way into the front. You're mostly adding length to the back, but you'll be adding a little bit of length to the sleeves and none to the front, um, except right by the underarms. So this is a drawing of that. I added the arrow to show that the, um, that it goes all the way around, obviously the short rows, but this is showing the front of the sweater and you can see we always draw the front neck a little bit lower than the back neck. Okay, so this is what that looks like if you're looking down at the top of the sweater and it's like stretched out. So you're looking at the neck. And um, I colored it to match the little picture. I colored the big picture to match the little picture so the sections work out. So, and I marked a line at the center front where it would be if you're having the cardigan. So the section that is outside of the main ellipse that has the green arrows in it, that's where you'll be doing short rows. So they'll start, you'll be starting on the front near the shoulder, then going across the sleeve, across the back, across the sleeve, and then back to the front. And then each time you turn and do a short row, you work it over fewer stitches. And you only do, you know, two or three sets of short rows, something like that. We only want to add an inch, maybe. We don't want to, you know, have a big bulge in our back. Just enough to add, you know, half an inch to an inch, something like that. But the reason we do it all the way around into the, you know, past the sleeves is so that it's smooth. If you did it only on the back, it would create a bump on the back. And we want this to smoothly fit into the whole um, upper portion of the sweater. And then I included this in, which is the, you don't have to read it now, but it's the exact instructions of how to work the short rows and it's, um, you can follow these instructions to add them 
whatever size you are, because it's basically saying go to the marker for this side of the armhole in the body and then go three stitches past it or whatever. So it works for any size. And then um, it refers to wrap and turn for the short row. Cause when I wrote my book, Ethnic Knitting Exploration, I used to do the wrap and turn short rows cause that's the first kind I learned but they're not my favorite anymore. This um, German double stitch short row is my favorite. So I'm gonna show you that. But before we go to that, do any of you have questions about the general concept or process of putting the short rows in at the beginning of the yoke? I do, Donna. Um, you said work six or eight, two or three sets in six to eight rows. So while, while we're putting this section in, are we all, are, for example, are we doing a couple of short rows and then going all the way around into the color work? No, I do, well, I do, um, I'll do there and back, there and back, there and back going a little bit fewer stitches each time and then go back to knitting in the round and then I start the color work. So you don't need to do a full round between each set of short rows. What I mean by a set of short rows is working in one direction and then back in the other direction. So, it, so basically a set of short rows is two rows, um, but you do not need to put a plain row between each of them. Now, if you do the wrap and turn, when you do that one round after all the short rows, you will have to pick up all the wraps as you go. And they'll all be on one round. I also do at least one round, maybe two rounds, two or three rounds before I start the short rows so that everything's joined at the um, seam, at the quote seams for the underarm. I don't want to start the short rows right on the first row of joining. I want to have everything connected and feel like it's all secure before I do the short rows on the back. Any other questions on that? Okay. Let me show you how, how, how I do this German double stitch thing because I really like this. Come on, camera. My camera shut off. There it is. Yay. Okay. Okay. So here's my sleeve. I'm just using the sleeve as an example um, because I have stitches on a needle. So I'm going to pretend this is my yoke of my sweater. And um, knitting in the round. So I'm going to knit, knit in the round, knit, 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 knit. And I'm going to go all the way up to wherever I want to turn. Okay. So I get to where I want to turn. Okay. And now normally you would wrap and turn the next stitch if you're doing the wrap and turn. So I'm not going to do anything special. I'm going to knit that stitch and turn. Okay, now I'm going to do something that you're normally not supposed to do. So normally I would, I would pull my yarn to the front and purl into this stitch, right? But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this up really tight. And can you see how it pulled the two legs of the stitch below up to make one? You know, that's like a mistake. In your turning, when you start knitting, if you turn and pull your yarn over the top, it adds an extra stitch by accident. Well, that's what we want to do on purpose. I pull that really tight up and then slide it back onto my other needle. And I've got those extra, extra things there. And then I'm just going to continue doing my thing. And because I pull that up really tight, there's going to be two strands there when I go back and I'm just going to work them together. So let's just say I wanted, I'm on the pearl side. I want to turn, I'm going to do that one last stitch. 
turn. Don't drop your needle out of your knitting. Turn and then as as <laughs> I dropped my knitting. All right. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna pull it. Gonna pull it up really tight so that we get those two stitches over the knitting. Okay, and I don't think you could see that really clear on this. I'm thinking about it because I have this yarn and it's marled and everything. So I have another video on this on YouTube. So I'll include the link in the email when I send you this video so that you can look up that one. I wasn't thinking about it uh, clearly enough, but this yarn is really hard to see how many strands you have and everything because of the two colors in it. So I will shoot you the link to that other one. But basically you're just pulling that up and it's called a German double stitch because I um, that's what I've seen it called. And I learned it when I was translating German knitting books. And basically you're just pulling that yarn over the top so that the two strands of the stitch below come up and later you knit or purl them together. We'll be knitting together because when we go all the way around, we will be on the right side of the work. Mm -hmm. And um, that's closing the hole. So basically anytime you're doing a short row, there's like a bunch of different ways to do it. This German double stitch, you pull up this extra strand from the row below, wrap and turn, you're adding an extra strand by wrapping the yarn around. There's also a way to do short rows where you make yarn overs um, where you turn. What all of those things do is add an extra strand of yarn where you're turning around so that you're not making a hole in your knitting. That's, that's really all it is. So any kind of short rows you like to do, you can use that technique on this. And I always do it um, before and after all the color work. Uh, basically it works really good in the fit of the sweater. And then also I don't have to mess with the color work charts and trying to figure out what if I didn't, you know, how do I finish that repeat if I did short rows in the middle of a color work pattern. So it's best to just do it right before it and right after it. Okay. Any questions about that? I know that, like I said, that didn't show up as good as I wanted with that yarn. So I'll send you another video, but any questions about doing short rows in, in general has, is there anyone here that's never done short rows? All right, so you guys are golden then. You can do whatever kind of short rows that you prefer. I have a clarifying uh -huh. question for you, Donna. Of course. Um, so the the length of the short row part of it, you, in the diagram, you had the picture going around to the front piece of the yoke um, right. to the underarm, right? So, and then you decrease for a couple of sets. So you do- Right, like, well, you don't have to decrease, but you knit less you don't knit the all short the way row is to, shorter. The short row is shorter. Right. Okay. So you'll knit like say the first time three stitches past where it joint where the into the front. Then on your next short rows, you'll only be going on to the sleeve. You won't make it all the way onto the front because your short row is shorter. Because you're only going a little bit onto the front. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense. I wanted just to clarify the the amount around that you go. So thank right. you for that. Just past the just past the join to the front just a little bit past that. Thanks. Good, good question, yeah. Okay, so back to my slideshow and you can pin that again if you need to. Um, it might come up full screen. Anyway, okay, so now we have this. We've done a little bit of short row shaping at the bottom. And now we have three sections where we can put color work patterns. So the big thing here is figuring out what color work patterns are gonna fit. And of course, all that depends on the number of rows that you have in each section. So of course your bottom section will be the biggest section because it's half the total length of your yoke. So um, again, we just, just say 12, 12 inches, that's a big yoke. You, most of yours are probably gonna be between eight and 10 inches, maybe 11, but 12 is generally as large as you get. I know it's a percentage thing, um, but um, our bodies don't um, scale up 
proportionally. So if we get um, bigger, as I have gained weight since I was in my 20s, I'm about 30 or 40 pounds bigger than I was in my 20s, right? And so my sweaters are bigger around, mm -hmm. but they're not really much longer, right? My armholes are bigger, which will make my yoke a little bigger, but the length of my yoke to the underarm is the same as it was when I was a smaller size. Um, I might make it a little bigger because I don't want it to be tight in my underarms, but, but you know, our sweater body may change from something like 30, 32 inches to 68 inches in the range of sizes that we're doing, but our yoke's probably going to range from eight to 12 inches. So it's a much less of a range for the yoke. So if you, if you're not sure what to do, Again, measure another sweater. If you don't have a yoke sweater, if you have like a t-shirt or something, you can still measure from the, from the neckline or the shoulder line, uh, neckline's best, to the bottom of the armhole. And that's about the depth that your yoke is gonna be because it goes from the neckline to the armhole. Um, it's a different way of combining pieces of fabric to make a sweater than a set in sleeve or a, a drop shoulder sleeve, but it's the, basically the yoke is the part that goes from the armhole to the neck. So you can measure other things. Um, and if you have a question on that and you want to show me um, a garment that you like that fits you well, that's not a yoke sweater and you want to go over the measurements with me to kind of make sure you're making your yoke the right length. I'm happy to do that with you. You can email me any, any time to go over that. And if we have to, um, um, we can share some math and sketches and whatever to figure it out for you. Okay, so, so anyway, the, what you want to know is the total number of rounds that are going to be in your yoke is the number of inches your yoke is going to be tall, so say 10, times your row gauge, say seven rows per inch. So that will give you 70 rows. So half of that for the bottom part will be 35 rows, and then the next two will be like 17 or 18 rows each. So that helps you see like what charts uh, what charts you can put in the different sections. Like if you want that, that um, and in the bottom part, if you don't want one big giant motif, you can put two, you know, two smaller ones that are, that are, um, you know, 12 or 14 rows in the chart and then put two plain rows between them. So you don't have to do a giant motif around the bottom. But so the main thing is figuring out the, height, how many rows and rounds you've got based on your gate, row gauge and your depth of the yoke. And then the second thing is basically the same as what we talked about on the sleeves, which is the stitch multiple and how many stitches you have around the sweater. And I, and I gave you some a uh, little bit of numbers in the previous lesson in the, in the slideshow and there's a whole section in ethnic exploration about how to adjust for fitting different numbers of stitches in. So you can fudge. So say you're supposed to have 580 stitches in your yoke and you need 560 for the repeat of your pattern, you know, or um, 10 stitches is a lot. So that's a couple inches. So you might not want to decrease that much. You might want to take your chart and see, can you, can you add one extra stitch to each repeat or take a stitch off each repeat um, to make it a different multiple? And we looked at all of that last time. All that's the same here. Again, if you have a chart you want to use and a number of stitches and it's not working and you can't figure it out, let me know. We can do the math together. Um, arithmetic, really. Um, just multiplication and stuff like that. But uh, if you're not sure how to figure it out, let me know after you look at the book and doesn't make any, if it doesn't make any sense to you, I'm happy to help. So other thing you can do, which is what I'm planning to do on mine is to switch the two colors in the, in one of the bands. So I'm gonna, I did um, the white as the background color and the dark brown um, 
what I have for dark brown for my contrasting color on the sleeves. When I get up to the yoke, I'm going to do white as the background color with brown um, for one of the stripes. I don't know if I'm going to do that first or the middle one. And I'm going to do one of the other stripes with the background color as the brown and the pattern color as the white so that it changes up a little bit. And I think on mine, if I have enough yarn left, I'm going to do the neck band in the marled. I'm not going to keep it going in the white the way I have in the drawing. So you can play with your colors like that. You don't have to do the whole top um, with the with the undyed as the background color for the whole top. You can switch that around for one one stripe. The middle stripe would be really cool because then it would be white, dark, white. And then you can decide if you want to continue white or do a color one of your color yarns for the neck band. Um, but so think about that. You can, you can be creative with that. You don't have to follow um, which one is the main color and the contrast color in each. It doesn't have to be the same in every section of the yoke. So feel free to change that. You can even do like each color section, uh, each chart white with the color um, contrasting color for the pattern. And then there's a couple of plain rows between each strip, each chart pattern where you do the decreases and, and stuff. And you could do those in the color as well to create lines of the color between your uh, white background sections. So, you know, feel free, do, what, do whatever you want to play with. If you think that you might not like it and you're going to possibly rip it out, um, put lifelines in between when you start a new section. So after you do a decrease um, or after you do your short rows or you do decrease before you start the chart, put a lifeline in. So that way, if you decide you don't like that section after you've knit part or all of it, it's real easy to rip it out without worrying about going accidentally dropping stitches all the way down into your short rows or where you joined your arms uh, to the body. So I definitely recommend lifelines in this section, not necessarily for making, you know, in case you make a mistake and just in case you change your mind and you want to try something different with the colors. Everyone's done a lifeline, right? Is there anyone who hasn't? Okay. Okay, so um, that's it for the lesson here of what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to, we got a lot of knitting to do. Um, and of course you don't have to keep up, but if you want to keep up, um, we want to be, be have um, at least most of our yoke knit by October 2nd. So for some of us, that's more than others, but we do have October 16th um, on the schedule already put in Zoom. So we can use that for catching up a little bit of finishing or show and tell if everyone's done or last Q&A if, uh, if we're not all done and everything. So um, I'm glad I had that in there. I, I don't remember having it planned, but I'm glad I, I have that in there because I'm going to need the extra two weeks. <laughs> so so um, any, any questions um, just uh, on the color work part? on what, what, or any ideas on what you might want to do with your color work and arrangement of colors. Anyone want to share anything with that? I've no. got a question. Um, if you're going to be doing the cardigan, what, is there anything special with the col color work you need to worry about because of sticking it? Oh, great question. So if you're doing a cardigan, and this is in the book, but if you're doing a cardigan, so you've got those, um, you want to, um, you know, have your repeat. So you have like, if you're doing a chicken, say a whole oh, chicken no, no, on each side, a whole chicken on each side of the opening no, for the front, you know, or a whole flower or a whole diamond, whatever, right? Um, but over the steak, the steak part, those extra stitches, you're not gonna work the charted pattern. Um, I just do, I do vertical columns because remember, we're going to cut it straight down that center stitch. Some of you purled it. Um, mm -hmm. I do right. vertical columns. So I will do color A, color B, color A, color B, color A, 
across my feet. And the same on every row. So that I've got a column of white, a column of color, a column of white, a column of color. First of all, then there's no floats going across the speak part. So all, where we're gonna cut it, all the colors are used and they're really woven in good together. Second of all, with those vertical columns of color, it's really easy to see in the color work part where to cut it. You can still purl the sec center stitch if you want, um, but if you don't want to, it's okay because you'll still see that column really clearly because of the color changes. Okay, that, thank you. Does that answer it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. That's, sure. Some people do it in that little pattern where they change the colors every row where they'll go A, B, A, B, A, B. And then the next row they go B, A, B, A, B, A. That works fine too. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really easier when you have the colors lined up on every round. So you have vertical, vertical stripes because you're going to cut up that one and it just shows up really clearly. And I'm all about like being able to see what I'm doing when I'm cutting my knitting. What? And um, I'm almost done with my. Oh my God, yoke. look at you. Yeah. So the, um, it fits beautifully. Like I, I'm so Yay! happy with how it fits. I did not do short rows for the, the, at the bottom of the yoke, but I will be doing them at, for the neck. Okay. Um, so I'm, okay. it's just kind of sitting here on hold. All these stitches are sitting here on hold. Cause I want to, I kind of like a more open neck. So right now, you know, it's, I'm not There's completely finished. About what to do, right. Yeah. So I got to no. decide. Mm -hmm. on that, but, yeah. Because but there's I really lots do. of options. What do you got? Yeah. Chickens, chicken feet. And then one of the motifs from the book. Yep. Cool. Yeah. It was really fun. I actually kind of screwed up a little bit because I went, too far here <laughs> but it the the it decreases didn't seem to cause a problem it fits just great so i was afraid that it would like be weird on the fit you were it, off a couple rows or something yeah yeah a couple i, I rows did a few rows. too many rows on the uh -huh. on the bottom section but and then it, it made it a me. design element where you have like a white stripe between yeah. your color patterns <laughs> I yeah. mean, at first I was like, well, should I rip it back? I'm like, no, because I'm actually fine with that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm uh -huh. just leaving it. Um, I'm just excited to do the the neck and stuff, but I'm just going to keep it on this really long circular for, for until now. we get to that. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, the chickens. Oh, that's so I cool. I do too. The chickens are so cute. They're so cute. Cool. Yeah. And it, like I said, it fits perfect. It's I'm Super so fun. happy with the fit. That I was makes still me a little happy. Yeah. I was a little nervous when I was making it. I was like, did I choose the right size and everything? Did I do my math right? But it fits great. So yeah, I'm, I'm stoked about that. Great. Great. Bonnie, I, you were holding yours up. Oh, uh, no, I, I know was, you finished it before last week, even, oh, but no, I was, I was just trying to see if I did the color work like you described and I think the bottom is the dark with the light and then the rest oh, yeah. is the, and then you, the dark, I think. Right, and those, um, yes. And so each of those charts, you could have done the colors either way and it yeah. would have looked completely different. Yeah, so I, I, I was just trying to compare with what you were talking about. Right. I, I think that works. It works great, yeah. And it would have worked great the other way. It just would have been a different design. Been different, yeah. Well, yeah. not knowing what I was doing, I'm trying to... I do have one request. Um, okay. Are you going to talk sometime in the future about using a steak or making one or working with one? Because I never yeah. heard of that before. And Yes, we talked about it a little bit before. We can talk about it a little bit right now, too. Um, Basically, when you want to make a cardigan, now you did not put a steak in. A steak, the word steak in Scottish means stitch. But in English knitting books, it means extra stitches you put in where you're going to cut your knitting open. Now, to make a cardigan out of a pullover, you do not need extra stitches. You can just cut your cardigan, your pullover right up the center and no. make it into a uh, cardigan. Of course, this makes us very nervous, right? <laughs> so generally, if we're planning ahead that we're going to do that, we will put extra stitches in so we're not cutting into our main sweater. This is this little extra inch of stitches that goes up the front, just put there to cut. 
So that way, you know, it's not going to unravel. Nothing's going to happen. We're going to secure everything. But like, say, um, Bonnie, you or Heather or anyone else that did a pullover, change your mind, you want a cardigan, you can still make, you can still make a cardigan. And yes, um, in the very last week, um, I am going to show you how to cut this to secure and cut the steak. It's part of the finishing. And if you uh, want to try it and you, and if you're making a cardigan and you've never done that before, or if you just want to try it and you're making, you're making or made a pullover, um, we can use a swatch. You can make a little circular swatch with, with or without extra stitches in it for the steak part. And you can use that and we'll secure it and cut it. And I definitely recommend doing it on the swatch um, first if you've never done it before or if you haven't done it in a long time because it's much less stressful on a swatch. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the idea of cutting into a knitted sweater, just I, I get nightmares about that. Yeah, I've done it a couple times for different reasons. I've done it for... Um, Making a, I made one cardigan into a, uh, I made one cardigan out of a pullover, and it wasn't pre-planned, so I just cut it up the center. I've done it for neck shaping, like I wanted a deeper neck, so I just cut the neck out of the front of the sweater, and <laughs> and then I made one sweater that um, it grew when I washed it. It was a cable sweater and it was super wash and the sleeve got like six inches longer than my arms when I washed it. They were almost down to my knees. So I had to cut the sleeves off at the bottom and add new cuffs. So those were my three major um, cutting adventures. <laughs> um, yeah. And of course, I've, I've done them all. I've tried all that stuff first on, uh, on swatches to... The, the, cutting the sleeves off was the worst because um, it's going up and down. You know, of course, I cut it from the bottom and your knitting never wants to ravel backwards. You know, if you remember when we wore pantyhose and you got to run, it only runs in one direction. It doesn't run in the other direction. So if, if when I cut the bottom off my bottom up, you know, cuff up sleeves, it, it wasn't going to unravel but you do have to catch all the stitches and put them back on the needles and then you're knitting in the other direction to add the cuff so it was that was probably the most stressful one for me <laughs> yeah and then and I never ruined the knitting by cutting it I ruined a dress once that I was sewing because I cut a hole in this skirt <laughs> by accident but I never ruined the knitting by cutting it <laughs> what well, you remember when I started Donna and yeah. it, it, uh, it had gotten twisted. Yeah, yeah. So I actually steaked my bottom four stitches. I'll show you. Let's see what I can show you. Right there. It, it, there's a, I did and then it you rejoined it. And then, and then I rejoined it in, into the round and everything. So I have four inches that are already cut apart. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Four, the first four rows or so. Yeah, so Gail had a twist. She joined to knit in the round. She thought it was not twisted. And then she knit four or five rounds and it was twisted. Okay, yeah. you know, when we, bleh, right? Who wants to rip yeah. out four or five four rounds of 200 stitches? And right. So, yeah, so we talked about it in the email and we decided, like, steak it now. So I and then rejoin and go on because you're going to cut that open anyway. And, right. Um, it worked it, fine. Untwist it and then knit the rest. <laughs> yeah, it worked yeah. great. And cool. so now cool. wow. I did it on a sewing machine is what I did on each, each side of the stitch. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I have some sewing machine, machine stitches and then I'll just, you know, continue up when I've got the party going all right, done. Right. Yeah. And we'll look at that um, sewing machine and uh, crochet version. Uh, I've okay. used both. Yeah, uh, sewing machine, because not everyone has a sewing machine, or also some people aesthetically prefer to have something done by hand with the yarn to join to, to secure it rather than sewing machine thread. Um, so we'll look at both of those uh, and then how to, you know, what kind of button bands you can add to it. Yeah, I was going to add, how wide are the branch. button bands usually? How, how wide are they? Usually an inch, but you can do whatever okay. you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
sometimes I like to just add an I chord um, and put a zipper in or add nothing and put a zipper in because you could just fold the steaks to the inside of the sweater and put a zipper right. in. But I usually put something, I usually put something on it uh, to finish off the front. And then sometimes we can look at this too. Sometimes I'll take a really pretty grow grain ribbon, sometimes with the print on it and use that to sew a facing over the steak parts on the inside, especially if I put a zipper in. Um, if you put a button band in, there's a kind of button band you can put in that automatically covers up the steak part. We'll look at that. Yeah, okay. lots of extra, uh, not lots of, but extra finishing on a cardigan. On a pullover, I mean, there's nothing but weaving in the ends and sewing those little right. arms, the grafting right. them, but on a cardigan, you've got to do something for um, the front of it. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have a, a, is there a pattern for maybe uh, flowers in the color work? Oh, I have tons of color work charts with flowers. It's so popular in Lithuania. I okay. would be happy to email a few to all of you with the, with this video link and the PDF of the presentation. Yeah. I'll send you a few, a few fun color work flower patterns. Well, my, my last name's Bloom, and so I wanted to have some flowers in my color. Oh, that's work. cool. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yes. Yeah, and if you have anything that's like any tree or leaf-inspired type motifs, oh, yeah, uh, I would be yeah. interested in those as well. Okay, and you can also find tons. I will send some because I have a lot of botanical charts, um, color work charts. But also you could just either Google or search in Pinterest for... Um, knitting color work flower chart, knitting color work leaf chart, and you will find tons. Um, I, I have I have been collecting a few, but if you have a couple, I can also peruse. That would be awesome. Of course, of course, I'm happy to send leaves and flowers. I'll send. Um, super, yeah. Um, one thing, and I'm sure everybody already knows this because everybody's already done color, done color work before, but I had to remind myself because when I knit color work, I do one in each hand. And so I had to remember when I got to the next pattern that I had carried the white in my right hand and the- Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Right? Because I didn't want one to come out more than the other. And I almost made that mistake. And I think I would have had to rip that because I think it would have looked weird. Um, yes, if you so. do color work with one in each hand, or if you do um, the uh, if you do it with one hand and you carry one over and one under, you're going to have a dominant color. So that color stitches are going to be a teeny bit bigger than the stitches of the other color. So you want to write down which color you carry in each hand, or which color you carry over and which color you carry under. Not everybody does color work with one of those techniques. Um, I remember my mom and my grandmother used an older technique where you would just twist the colors. So it would go the same direction every time. There is no dominant color in that technique. But what there is, is your two yarns get barber pulled together and you have to pick it up the knitting and let it untwirl every now and then. So there's pros and cons to all these different techniques. Um, I usually do it with two hands but that does have the dominant color. And then sometimes I do the a technique I learned from a teacher in Canada, a Coast Salish knitting that's used in Cowlichin sweaters, where um, I the traditional way is to do it all with your right hand, but you could do it all with your left hand. It basically sort of works the same way as carrying one in each hand, but because you do it with one hand and you manually move the yarn to the back and the front over and under like this, and you do it the same with both colors, it comes out really stretchy and um, no dominant color for that technique. So there's so many different ways to do to do color work knitting. But if you're if you're not sure if your technique has a dominant color, or if you know you do over under over under or two hands, make sure you write down what you did uh, each color in because it will look different. It, it will look different on the. Uh, when you're done. You might not notice it as you're knitting, but at some point you will notice it. Um, so really interesting. Well, it's two o'clock, but I wanted to show you two books. Um, if there's any other questions, we can do them first. And then I wanna show you two books. So any last questions? No. Mm -hmm. No, no. 
Okay, so I have these two books here. I put them under my computer, so I have to move my computer to get them out. Okay, so I, I know I showed you like Knitting in the Old Way and the Opinionated Knitter the first week by Elizabeth Zimmerman and Priscilla Gibson Roberts. And then last week I showed you Kate Davies's book, Yokes. And I have two more books this week. One is Modern Lopey. So if you like these sweaters, Modern Lopey um, by Lars Rains. This is a really cool book. It's all, all kinds of, I can't tell which way to move things through the camera. All kinds of fun yoke sweaters made with the heavy, the yoke, the traditional lopey Icelandic yarn is generally bulky. It's a little bit heavier than what we're using, but he's got a ton of, of sweaters here. Some of them are with the traditional color work patterns. Mm. And then he's, uh, he calls it modern low because he's worked with the, you know, basic shaping of, of the sweater. See, that's kind of basically the same thing we're doing. Mm. But he also has some with cables and solid colors and different things. So it's really, it's a really a fun book if you like these, where do I go? If you like these sweaters and you want to explore more with that shaping and you like, um, heavy yarns where you can, you know, knit a sweater in less than three years. This is really good. So the yarn's a little bit heavier than what we're using. So good winter sweaters. And then um, this is the Knitting with like Flanders Wool by Vedis uh, Jonsdotter. I'm sure I've said that wrong because it's an Icelandic <laughs> name but it's got sweaters and other things in it. But they, again, used with the uh, Icelandic wool. And she's got, look at that, isn't that gorgeous? A long coat made with the yoke design and the Icelandic wool and different sweaters. And here's a really cute kids one with a hood. And, um, and then she's got other things as well that you can make with the patterns for using the yarn if you don't want to make the traditional traditional yoke sweaters. Oh, this is really cool too. I just love this book. I never made anything from it, but look, there's a dress. Isn't that so cool? Wow. Anyway, so those are two books I wanted to show you if you want to learn more about um, the traditional Icelandic yarn, which, um, is usually not plied. It's one, it's very loosely spun. Sometimes it's not really, it's just spun just enough to not fall apart when you knit with it. So it's a very different experience. Uh, I wanted to focus on the knitting and I really like this marled yarn idea where you have to ply it um, to get those two colors together. So I didn't um, want to use a singles yarn for this sweater, but it's, it's really, it's really, uh, a nice yarn for making that kind of sweater. And that's um, that's all I have for today. So I will, oh, got, got someone got this book in Iceland, cool. Um, that's great. So um, I will send you this video link, the slideshow and some charts for flowers and leaves and the other link to the German double stitch video. And you can email me anytime if you have questions and uh, I'll see you in email or in our next Zoom in two weeks. Okay. okay. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks Donna. Thanks, Donna. Take care. Thank have you. Thank you Donna.